Let's give him a welcome. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, so, first of all, I might move back to the podium if that's okay with you. I just I don't want to mess up this guy's mic configuration. Um, first of all, despite how much of an advertisement session the title sounds like. I'm going to try to keep it not as an ad session where I'm just saying the name of my company repeatedly because I've been to those sessions before and they're not very fun. Uh, so I'm going to try to talk about actual Python data stuff because we do a lot of Python data stuff. Uh, and in our experience, um, if we present something interesting uh, and then at the end of the talk say, oh, also, by the way, our name is Quantopian, that works far more effectively at getting those who are actually interested to talk to us than um, just saying our name repeatedly. It tends to turn off our target demographic. So uh, Quantopian is a company in um, Boston. We're a startup. We've been around for about four years now, and we're the world's first crowdsourced hedge fund, which means that uh, we allow anybody from anywhere in the world as long as they have an internet connection and can program Python um, to try to develop uh, strategies for trading. Uh, and then we evaluate those strategies and fund the best ones. And we pay the users 10% um, of the profits they make, uh, which in finance is uh, a, pretty, a pretty generous um, manager's allocation. Uh, the investor, of course, the original hedge fund investor is taking home the, the lion's share of the profits. Uh, and it's all voluntary. So one of the big things that separates us from most finance firms uh, is uh, we have a GitHub, which is <laughs> a little uncommon. Um, you're getting the private view, by the way, so I gotta be a little careful not to click on certain things. Uh, despite the fact that we are a company that has a GitHub and promotes open source development and all that good stuff. Um, there, it's really hard in the US to get around the legal fact that when you become a hedge fund, there's a lot of extra ways to go to jail that didn't exist before. So <laughs> I just have to be a little careful nowadays. Um, uh, one of the first things that we did uh, was we open sourced our backtesting engine. For those of you who are not familiar, a backtest is when you take an algorithmic trading strategy and you run it in history and say, how would it have done? So that's one of the first things we did is we open sourced our backtesting engine. Uh, that's all available online. You guys can go and check it out. Um, and just, just I, need to, I need to show my, uh, my credentials here because again, I want you guys to know that I am not just another uh, front office guy who's not wearing a suit because he's talking to a, a Python audience, but you know, you know the type I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> can go to GitHub, and I am indeed a contributor on this repo. So, this is this is my effort to convince you that I at least know something about this stuff. Um, so, uh, Zipline is an open source back tester. We have been told many times that we are insane for releasing this information because it just goes completely against the standard finance mantra of secrecy. Um, we've open sourced a lot of other stuff. Uh, feel free to check out the GitHub if you're interested. Uh, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff there, honestly. Um, we've open sourced uh, just even like operational stuff, like it's part of the stuff for running our app. Um, because we have to maintain many servers that have to be very reliable because the difference for us is that um, if you're like some social media startup and you know one of your servers breaks down, someone loses their vacation photos. If one of our servers breaks down, someone loses their retirement savings. So we have to be a lot more careful about reliability um, and actually that pressure uh, has been really interesting to navigate as a startup because um, kind of cross, crossing both the big bank compliance and regulation side about you know, other, running other people's money, plus like the we're a small startup, we're cool, we do what we want side, is, is it's, it's just a really interesting, uh, interesting cross-section of cultures. So what we're gonna talk about today uh, is Paris trading. Uh, and the reason that I like to talk about this is 
It gives you a sense of a lot of different interesting stuff. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with algorithmic trading or quantitative finance, it's going to be a brief intro and kind of maybe a general sense of part of what that means. Um, for those of you who are uh, not familiar with how we use IPython or data-driven technologies, it's also a, a way to see that. So one of the things that we do nowadays, uh, which is what I run, uh, is the lectures. So on, on, on this website, if you go under help, I'm trying to get this up onto the main menu. Um, you know, it lives under help right now, and any of you who have worked in uh, business development know that this is like suicide for a link if you put in a drop-down menu. Mm -hmm. So uh, right now on um, lectures, uh, this is the result of us working with a lot of schools. So about a year ago now, Quantopian started partnering with schools all around the world. Uh, and uh, in working with these schools, um, we started developing a lot of quantitative finance curriculum. Um, the genesis of this was actually uh, Pavlos Protopapas at Harvard, who teaches his entire course with uh, IPython notebooks, or what I should call now Jupyter Hub notebooks, but are previously known, the artist previously known as IPython notebooks. And um, so talking to him was like the initial inspiration to actually build a course based on this stuff. Uh, and then we started partnering with other schools like uh, Stanford and MIT. Um, and expanding out and you know we've worked with lots of different names now but the long and short of it is that all of these lectures are kind of products of us working with professors um, and uh, the ones that are not products of us working with professors we show to professors so that they can tell us how much they suck and we can fix them so the one we're going to talk about today is Paris trading uh, this was actually the first lecture that we ever made um, and See, this is always the will it load moment. Some connection can get very unhappy with this, depending on how the, the port filtering is done, but usually it's fine. All right, some of you may recognize this menu bar here. All right, show of hands, who here has worked with IPython notebooks before? Awesome. All right, I can skip the introduction. Um, so, <clears throat> This is uh, our attempt at an interactive textbook taught through an IPython notebook. Uh, and the advantage of this, uh, for any of you who are unfamiliar with the act of buying uh, data for finance, it's very expensive. I mean, let me just stop there. It's very expensive. Uh, and you have to like wear a suit and know the right address in Manhattan and call the right guy on the phone. It's just like a very uh, archaic industry. And that's actually um, one of the big differences between finance and a lot of other fields right now, is that in finance, data is incredibly expensive to buy. So even if you want to do something cool in finance, oftentimes the simple act of getting the data first, is that's the barrier to entry. Um, because unless you have like tens of thousands of dollars lying around, they are not gonna sell you a license to get at this data. So one of our, uh, one of our uh, value adds basically that we try to deliver is uh, in these notebooks you can get at pricing data uh, and you'll see that later in the notebook um, so you can't download it but you can run any Python queries against it uh, in these notebooks that you want so we basically um, that's how we, we give you the flexibility to do you do your data projects on these notebooks and this is all in browser by the way uh, so these are all being run on our servers um, I have actually switched over from using IPython on my own laptop to just these notebooks for everything, not just like Quantopian related stuff. Like I use them to like calculate my personal finances and everything because just just it's one less click, right? I don't have to open up a terminal terminal and type IPython notebook. Um, I can just go here, and uh, it's dangerously convenient, I'd say. Um, so here's the first thing we're gonna do. We're going to make a fake asset or stock, as some of you may have seen before. So that looks like a stock, right? Ish. If I showed you that, showed you a picture of that, and was like, "That's a market," you'd be like, "Sure, looks like a market. Let's talk intelligently about this market, right?" No reason to suspect that's wrong. 
Uh, turns out that there's actually a horrible, horrible reason to suspect that's wrong, which is nothing in finance is drawn from a normal distribution. But we're going to completely ignore that today for the sake of being simple. Um, and uh, this is a stock. Okay? Now we're going to generate another stock. The way we're going to do this is we're going to take the first stock, we're going to shift it up by five, we're going to add some noise. Again, normal. Don't try this at home. Um, the reason, by the way, that it's so dangerous to assume normality in finance is you'd be surprised at the number of statistical procedures for which if you read the fine print of required assumptions for these statistics to make any sense, somewhere buried in there is assume normality. And the reason for that is because when you assume normality of a data generating process, you have some sense of the distribution of results that it's going to give you, and some sense of the range of results that it's going to give you. In finance, there have been famous cases of people doing things like assuming returns on the US market are normally distributed, and then getting unpleasantly surprised by negative 10 standard deviation events, right? Which are fairly common on the US market. So uh, for those of you who are familiar with tail risk, that's what's happening here. For those of you who are not familiar with tail risk, um, you probably don't work in finance, but it's basically just when you have a distribution that has fat tails, so the probability of these extreme events happening is significantly greater than zero compared to in a normal distribution where it is for all intents and purposes zero. <coughs> so we're taking another security, making it be the first one, shift it up by five, plus some random noise. Make sense? Now, the reason for this, the reasoning behind this is we're trying to model uh, two securities that are affected by the same broad economic factors. So when one of them goes up, the other goes up. When one of them goes down, the other one goes down. Make sense? However, because this is the real world, there's going to be noise in that relationship. So they will not always follow this pattern of being precisely $5 apart in value per share. And it turns out that you can take advantage of this noise. Because for those of you who are familiar with mean reversion in statistics, whenever you have well-defined processes that have noise, because the noise uh, basically produces a spread around a mean, when you're higher than the mean, you can be pretty confident that you're going to be lower at some point in the future. When you're lower than the mean, you can be pretty confident that you're going to be higher at some point in the future. Assuming mean reversion holds, and you, know, you have to do that, at, that statistical validation to convince yourself that mean reversion holds in the first place. Uh, but th that's what we're going to try to take advantage of here. We're going to try to take advantage of the mean reversion <coughs> in the spread of two securities. And when you have a mean reverting spread, that's known as co-integration or co-integrated pairs. And the actual mathematical definition of co-integration uh, is not very friendly. It's well defined on Wikipedia. If you're interested, I recommend you look it up. Uh, it deals with fun time series analyses topics like orders of integration and stationarity and Wold's theorem. And uh, in practice, time series analysis is this like weird little corner of the statistics universe because most of statistics uh, was developed assuming that there was kind of no time dimension, that populations were unordered, and you could consider populations as these unordered sets. Um, and that's very much not the case when you add a time dimension to your data. So there's like a whole host of um, what's known as time series analysis, and uh, econometrics uses a lot of time series analysis. There's a whole host of statistics and statistical correction factors that have been developed to try to deal with some of this weirdness with, with time series data. But for now, all you have to understand is that on an intuitive level, co-integration behavior is when you have that mean reverting behavior um, with the spread of two securities, or the difference. And we can look at that. We'll look at the ratio here. We could equivalently look at um, we could equivalently look at the the difference between them we're looking at the ratio because some people like to consider the pair ratio um, I'll quickly change it to the difference here so this is um, y minus x and you can see 
there's that mean reverting behavior and the difference that we're talking about. And you know, it better be there because we precisely modeled this in, right? Be very weirded out if that were not the case. Um, and it turns out that some friendly statisticians have written tests for co-integration, so you don't have to. And here's one of them. Um, we run that on x and y. Uh, does anybody know how significant this p-value is? Very significant. I see at least one person shaking their head. Uh, I've actually been on a dry spell as far as doing this. Uh, I say how significant is this p-value. It's a trick question. This is gotcha journalism, so I apologize. Um, p-values can't be more or less significant. They can only be binary, so they're greater or less than a predefined cutoff. And if you start thinking of them as more or less significant, you actually open yourself up to a whole host of statistical biases. Uh, so statisticians have developed these very careful steps that if you follow precisely, you'll have a good time. And if you don't follow precisely, you will think you are right when you are not actually right. And uh, it's important in quantitative finance because quantitative finance is the only subject in which the quality of your statistics is directly linked with your bank account balance. <laughs> So it, it pays, it pays to be careful. Um, so let's retroactively, like good statisticians, let's retroactively pick our cutoff uh, and let's just say 5% as our default, our default life sciences cutoff for any of you familiar with the research, research side of things. Um, I have a question. Yes. Uh, the quint quint uh, function mm -hmm. is a Quantopian function, or no. is it uh, Python? Models? Yeah, you can see we imported it, import it up here. It's in stats models. Stats models. Yep. So pretty much everything you see here is one of the standard uh, Python data libraries. Uh, we use a tremendous amount of pandas. If you are not familiar with pandas, become familiar with pandas. It is automagical. Uh, it knows what you want to do better than you know what you want to do. <laughs> I'm only half kidding about that. There's like, when you get good at pandas, there's just this sense that like, you become addicted to it. You become very dependent on it and then you move off to some other language and you like are terrified at like how little you know anymore about how to program. Um, so pandas is great. Uh, and then the, I'll show you, there's only gonna be a few functions that Quantopian injects into the memory space for these notebooks. Um, and they're mainly just to get access to the data. Uh, from our databases. So one point I want to make here, correlation is not the same thing as co-integration. They often are found together, but they're not the same topic. <coughs> it's not the same thing. So here you can see, uh, in our example, we generated uh, x to be correlated with y. So we're going to have very high correlation as well as statistically significant uh, co-integration. But it is possible to have one without the other in both directions. So uh, here is an example of correlation without co-integration. Correlated series, one explains motion and the other completely, but no mean reverting behavior in this spread. So correlation without co-integration, and the statistics back that up. Uh, and then here's the other direction. A little artificial, but you know, not too outlandish, especially if you're dealing with like different time scales or something. Um, no motion in one explained by motion in the other. No covariance. Uh, but uh, the spread, the difference between the two is going to cross over this mean a lot. So you get, again, backed up by the numbers, near zero correlation, um, significant p value on the co integration test. All right. That's the math side. Now we'll flip it over to the finance side. Who here is familiar with short selling? I feel like that's, a, that's kind of a, a bad thing to say in some circles. Just even bring up the topic that short selling exists. <laughs> I haven't seen The Big Short yet. Uh, it feels like work to go watch it, honestly. So I'm going to stay away from that for a little bit. Um, short selling. Wall Street black magic allows you to sell something before you own it, a device previously and debatably currently available only to criminals. So. Um, <laughs> It's very important, though, in quant finance. The main thing is it allows you to bet in both directions. Okay, So you can bet on something going up by buying it and holding it long. 
And you can bet on something going down by buying it and holding it short. Because a short position, for all intents and purposes, is just the mathematical inverse of a long position, which means you can multiply everything in your math by negative one. And it will like pretty much mostly work out. There are a few edge cases. Um, so it's also important because if you're doing quantitative finance and you have some formula that tells you how much of something you should buy, sometimes that formula should spit out a negative number. And with shorting, you can actually do that. You can buy negative 10 shares of a stock. And that's equivalent to shorting 10 positive shares of a stock. So the important point to know is just you make money when the underlying instrument loses value, and you lose money when the underlying instrument gains value. It's just the opposite. So uh, shorting is often used to do something called hedging. <coughs> Hedging uh, is a very interesting term, by the way, because uh, is anybody familiar with like where the term hedge funds come from? Yeah? Yes, I'm familiar. You're familiar with the term? <laughs> All right. I'm not going to ask you to share it, but you know. Um, so it is my understanding um, that the original uh, hedge funds were developed as a way to hedge out risk, because at the time, there were many funds that were long only in the market. And so there was a class of funds developed to try to avoid the possibility of a market crash by being long and short in the market, so that in the event of a market crash, you would be hedged against that. And um, you would gain money on your short position that you lost on your long position, and therefore even out that risk. Uh, of course, hedge funds have moved from something that was developed to be a safe asset class <coughs> to like the most exotic and risky asset class you can buy these days. So I always find it interesting how terms change over time. But the general idea is that it's uh, really similar in its like colloquial English usage to hedging your bets. Because the process of hedging is just trying to reduce the risk of a certain portfolio by taking out extra positions. You're, you're managing your risk. So what we're going to do here is um, try to figure out, OK, well, if we think that we found some example of co-integrated behavior between two real securities, how would we actually go about turning that into an algorithmic strategy? And the way that you do that uh, is as follows. Basically, you want to be able to enter into a position when the spread is especially small, such that when the spread gets larger, you make money. Ideally, you would also like it to be the case that if the spread does anything else, you don't lose any money. But that is, in practice, impossible. So what you can do is you can enter into a position such that if the spread is small, when the spread gets larger, you make money. And when the spread gets smaller, you lose money. And the way that you do that is if the spread is small, you take out a long position on the top one here and a short position on the bottom one. So it's long the top, short the bottom. And it turns out that you can like, draw it out in a piece of paper, but if the spread has gotten bigger at some point in the future, the top one must have gone up more than the bottom one went up, or the bottom one must have gone down more than the top one went down. And therefore, you're always going to have a net positive, because you'll make more on your long than you'll lose on your short, or you'll make more on your short than you'll lose on your long. So that's known as longing the spread. And the important point is because you are both long and short, it's OK if the market crashes, because you're going to break even. And so this is what's known as a market neutral strategy, because it means that if the market goes up, you break even. If the market goes down, you break even. What you're making money off of is the behavior of the spread. So it's a way of saying, well, I put all this effort into uh, mathematically modeling the behavior of this one specific thing, so I should also try to make a bet on this one specific thing, right? Not let a bunch of other conditions come into my bet along for the ride. So that's what this does. You can also go short the spread in the opposite direction by shorting the top, longing the bottom. That's the, that's the difference. That's, that's just the inverse position. So now we can go long and short the spread. All right, this is a Python crowd. So I'm comfortable doing the following. We're now abstracting this out. We have a new asset. There's an asset to, to go on the spread. You can go long on the spread, which means you make money when the spread rises and lose money when it, when it, when it falls. And you can also short that asset. Okay, So you can go long or short the spread asset. So we're going to abstract out 
actually how we do this position, but I've explained to you that it can be done. We've reduced it to a previously solved problem, so now we're going to go forward and say we can go long or short the spread. Make sense? Okay. So at this point, that's kind of that's the entire intuition for pairs trading, right? Because if you know how to make money based on the spread going a certain direction, and you think you have an understanding of how the spread works as a system, then you can use that understanding of how the spread works as a system to bet on it going in a certain direction in the future, and then take out that position of long and short the spread, and be right more than half the time, and therefore make money on average. That's the goal here, right? So. Now that we know how to do that, um, the next step is to find real stuff that works like this and then just make tons of money, um, which you will not do because of problems with statistics. But as an example, one thing that we're going to do here uh, is just as a, just as a, a fun example, uh, we are going to take a basket of assets and we're going to loop through that basket. These are going to be real assets. We're going to loop through that basket and we're going to run our co-integration test on every pair relationship in that basket and we're going to look for any that pop up is significant under a 5% cutoff. I used to not have this here and I used to ask for like people to like tell me what the problem was with that approach. Um, I was once doing this lecture for a, a stats prof and I had to like tell him to like not comment for the next five minutes before I did this part because I knew I knew that if, if I did not tell him, he would freak out. Um, so, people here are familiar with multiple comparisons bias? One of, I'm not gonna say the, but you know, definitely top five best biases in data science. Um, it's just the general idea that if there's no relationship present in your data, you will have p-values that can kind of come anywhere in the range, right? And so, uh, if you have a cutoff of 1% and run one p-value test, the chance that you get something accidentally significant is 1%. And if you run 100 of these tests, you should expect to get one thing that pops up as significant just by accident. No actual relationship. It is conveniently the case that the number of pairs grows quadratically with the underlying number of assets. So even with a small number of assets such as 20, we'd have to be running 200-ish pairwise tests. With a significance cutoff of 5, we should expect 10 to pop out, just, just purely based on, on chance. So in practice, this is a horrible way to actually see if anything is, is co-integrated. You have to do this maybe as a first pass and then do additional levels of statistical validation afterwards. But just you know, be aware that this is not, if you find something this way, very unlikely to make a lot of money off of it. I would argue probably going to go the other direction. So when I made this notebook a while back, I just kind of grabbed a bunch of solar companies out of a hat because I think solar is good. I like the environment. And uh, this is our pricing function. We can get, you can use get pricing to get pricing from our, our database. Uh, and you can see here, this is um, just the first five days of pricing for each of these assets that we're looking at. We're including the market in here. Um, why we're including the market, I will leave as an exercise to the reader. It's something that starts with confounding and ends with variable, but figure that out on your own. I'm not going to actually go into that today. Um, and here is a heat map. Remember when I said uh, p value should only be binary? Uh, it turns out it's actually okay to not treat them as binary if you're using them to convince yourself you're wrong. Because the whole point of statistics is to make it very difficult to convince yourself that your hypothesis is correct, right? And so it's conservative to make it more difficult to convince yourself your hypothesis is correct. So here, all we're looking for is potential warning signs with the p-values. Specifically, you know, if, so here's a relationship that popped out as possibly significant under the 5% cutoff. Um, and if we observed here and here, and then saw like a bunch of also green stuff, maybe we'd be like, maybe that's not a real significant relationship. Maybe this just is like some strangeness that's happening with this asset. We don't see that. 
so we don't ring any alarm bells, basically. It, this is just a way to get an extra level of validation and say, like, you know, is there something weird going on? Oftentimes, I like visualization as a way to see if there's anything weird going on in my data, more so than to convince myself that some model works. Because you can read anything you want to out of a picture. And so it's very dangerous to use it to convince yourself you're right. In general, you want to use pictures to convince yourself you're wrong or, or, or raise warning bells. So let's grab the actual data for those two things that we found. Um, and this is the ratio between them. Uh, I'm just going to run all these, all, this, all these cells again uh, just so we can maybe play with the data a little bit here. Um, let's look at the difference between them because that's what we looked at earlier. So that's the difference between them. This is, uh, this is what I mean about non-normality here, right? Because you have this like nice little happy process, and then all of a sudden, that's like a, what, a four standard deviation event or something, where you like fall this much and then start building back up again. So I would be very suspect of this pair in reality, OK? Um, there's a lot of reasons why you might not want to use this pair to trade. Uh, it doesn't really look like this is necessarily mean reverting. It looks like it's kind of going up and then falls and then goes up again. And at no point is that kind of that nice stationary mean reverting behavior. Um, so this is what I mean about extra layers of validation. You just constantly want to be doing validation. You can also look at the, the ratio between them as another form of validation. Uh, and you can see here, similarly, not necessarily, like there's some weirdness here that happens. There's a lot of cases in which like you might not want to trade something like this. There's, there's, a, there's enough warning signs here um, that you probably wouldn't want to trade this in reality. Uh, again, because this is a lecture, we're going to ignore that. So people here like z-scores. Z-scores are fun. As long as you don't accidentally infer anything about the distribution of the data, which I see everybody doing all the time when they take z-scores, if you're taking z-scores purely as a normalization technique, totally fine. That's what we're doing here. Um, this is a z-score of uh, the ratios. We'll run it again just to make sure. So it's just the ratios normalized down into that z-score, standard deviations away from mean. Um, and then, so a simple strategy would be uh, go long the spread whenever the uh, z-score is below negative 1 and go short the spread whenever the z-score is above 1. This is like, this is, this is literally a pairs trading strategy. This is what industry practitioners of pairs trading will do. They will compute a z-score of the spread and they will go long the spread whenever it's above that standard deviation threshold. They'll go short the spread. I'm oh, sorry, vice versa, short the spread when it's above, long the spread whenever it's below, and they'll just bet on that mean reverting behavior of the spread going back up and down. Right? And they'll accept the fact that for any given pair, their accuracy of predicting spread direction is not going to be great, so they'll just like do this over like 100 pairs at a time, right? and just a average out some of that error. OK, so this is a fun one because I haven't put my warning sign in this plot yet. I haven't gotten around to it. I've been lazy. Does anybody know what kind of bias we have here? This is a really subtle bias, by the way. And it actually creeps its way into many professional um, fund trading systems by accident. This is like probably the hardest bias to detect in practice in finance. Um, are you using the same data? The forward look up bias? Yep, look, look ahead bias. It's actually the first group in a while that's gotten that. That's awesome. Congratulations. Uh, <laughs> nobody gets that one. Um, look ahead bias. February 21st, uh, February 2014 uh, is computing a z score based on a mean and standard deviation computed on all of this data. Right? We only have data before February 2014 and February 2014. Very subtle look ahead bias. Very difficult to catch. Uh, in, in case you're like, not detecting the theme yet, um, quantitative finance, again, is just all about knowing your biases. 
It's, it's applied statistics, and it's just knowing your biases. So what we're going to do is we're just going to use rolling statistics instead so that we're only computing statistics based on data that we had available at the time. Uh, again, rolling statistics, just take the last n bars of data and compute the statistic over those. So 10 days, 60 day moving average. Uh, we're actually going to compute a z-score um, using a 10-day moving average that said the current value, uh, using a 60-day moving average as uh, the global mean, and the 60-day standard deviation as the global standard deviation. So we compute a z-score that way. This is what it looks like. Um, the reason that you use a 10-day moving average instead of the current value, uh, it depends on what you're doing. Sometimes in finance, the underlying price data is so noisy that it's like bad to use one single data point. So you try to like remove some of that noise by, by averaging out the last 10 and get a sense of what the current state of the system is. This would only work for a fairly low frequency trading system. Uh, and if you were looking at like a, a faster frequency like daily trading system, you'd need to like look at maybe the last uh, 20 minutes or something and try to average those out to get a sense of what the current trading price is. In general though, it's just, it can be bad to look at like one single data point because it's so noisy. You might experience like a, an outlier and, and make a big mistake based on that outlier. Okay, and then the final plot here, this is the actual underlying price data normalized down by 10 so we can see it in the same plot. This is the underlying price data of the two assets. These are, this is real data, again, of those two assets we are looking at. Uh, and then this is the signal processed z-score that we'd, be, we'd actually be trading on. So um, the last step in doing this would actually just be like writing an algorithm that would implement the z-score computation and then just run a periodic check and just say, if z-score is below or above these thresholds, make this trade. That's all the pairs trading algorithm is. And in practice, um, industry quants spend the vast majority of their time researching stuff in some kind of research environment, whether it be Python or R or MATLAB, um, and very little time actually like testing anything with execution or backtesting, um, because most of their time is just spent here, testing these statistical hypotheses, trying to figure out what's going on. In practice, it's way too easy to overfit backtests. So, I'll just go ahead and show you um, what it looks like. Uh, I'm not going to go into the algorithm too much, but I just want to show you guys uh, what it looks like to actually run a strategy like this. So uh, we also have a back test available in the lecture series for this one. Um, everything has a notebook. Most of them have videos, which is just me like sadly talking into a screen about the lecture. And then some <laughs> of them have a bonus back test. And, uh, <coughs> So this is what the um, backtesting environment looks like on Quantopian. Uh, and you can see this is the actual Python code that's making those trading decisions. So you can see here's our, here are our methods to order stocks. And we're like, we're computing the amount of percent, like the percentage of each stock we want to order. Um, here's the code that's actually like uh, checking for new z-scores and trying to figure out where the current spread is in the, in the, in the global distribution of spreads. Um, and if you go ahead and run this, um, it's definitely going to be overfit over 2014, but when you clone an algorithm, the run till date defaults to the most recently available trading day. So I'm pretty, co I'm pretty confident that given that I selected these stocks based on data from 2014 and then selected the runtime of the back test to also be from 2014, pretty confident it's going to have good, good returns, good performance over 2014. Um, but uh, I actually haven't run it over the out of sample period. What's interesting is that people on the internet don't click on algorithms unless they have good returns, right? <laughs> and so I have to simultaneously be like weakly overfitting the examples I give to people at the same time as telling them not to overfit. It's a really tough line to walk. Um, because people don't realize that like stuff that stuff that works you can't share exactly. You have to share templates, you know, and, and the templates aren't going to be very good by themselves. You need to go through and do that extra work. So it's just interesting how you have to compromise compromise in your statistics for the sake of you know not dying as a startup. <laughs>
So this one looks like it's actually doing pretty strong out of sample. So I'm actually kind of regretting not putting my money in it now. It's probably going to crash in a second. But anyway, that's, that's the algorithm running. Again, this is all running on our servers. Um, oh, there you go. Just lost a bunch of money. Um, it's giving you all sorts of uh, uh, all sorts of information about the runtime of the algorithm. Um, those are kind of the two main features on Quantopian that we offer: uh, is the research environment and then the ability to actually back test your stuff. Yeah, this is really not doing too well anymore. This is what I mean about overfit. You get this nice long, nice long run up over that in sample period. And then this just nice, long, consistent loss of money during that out of sample period. <laughs> Amazingly common. Amazingly common. Um, up there in that top statistical, like, bias greatest hits is survivorship bias. People familiar with survivorship bias? It's a huge one. Um, survivorship bias is the reason why you shouldn't trust wealth managers, or at least cannot, on face value, trust wealth managers, you know, because. Uh, the guy who's calling you up from Goldman Sachs asking to manage your money is the guy who didn't you know, lose all their money yesterday, and so you don't know which one's the lucky one. Um, and uh, it's just rampant in finance. Um, and actually, one of the things that Quantopian has is a bird's eye view of like all the, um, we don't look at the algorithms. The algorithms are kept private, and um, you keep all of your intellectual property on using the site. Again, like we have a GitHub. We're trying to be the good guys. Um, but uh, we look at performance results, so we can look at um, kind of the distribution of performance results. And uh, that's actually we're we're about to release a, a peer review publication um, talking about uh, the distribution of performance results of, of algorithms on Quantopian and like how it matches what people claim to be able to achieve in reality, and that it does not at all ever. So. Um, that's, that's most of what I uh, had to talk about for today. Um, I didn't want to keep it uh, too long. The last thing I just wanted to say is um, we also uh, occasionally, on kind of a piece by piece, piece, by piece basis, uh, one of the other things we do uh, is we, we uh, run workshops. We're just running our first one in Singapore. Um, and basically, we, we use the curriculum to teach this stuff. Uh, and we've we've hit all the standard locations so far. So we've done London, Paris, Boston, San Francisco, and everything. We're trying to keep that program going. And then we're also thinking about making um, an online course taught with IPython notebooks. So rather than going through like the Coursera platform, uh, actually just doing the whole thing in IPython notebooks and then making a certification. So the homework is actually write code to do this, you know, and 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 just completely doing away with like the multiple choice quizzes or anything like that. So. It's something we're working on. We're looking to go in different directions. Um, hopefully, this was at least somewhat interesting. Um, I'll be happy to take questions, or if anybody has any specific questions about the website while I'm up here, I'm happy to, to go over those. Or in general, questions in general, I'm happy to go over those. Yes? You said there will be workshops, or there was? Uh, well, we had a workshop. It takes a long time to fly here, so like by the time I fly to Boston, if I like immediately flew back, that'd probably be like two months from now. So like, um, we're looking at maybe doing um, we're looking at maybe doing some more stuff in June, uh, in Singapore at least. But we do other locations as well. So uh, there's a page quantopian.com/workshops. I'm not going to show it on principle for not like pitching, but um, if you're interested, you can go check it out. It's on the website. Yeah. If you have very little knowledge on algorithmic trading, can you use the lectures on your website to learn more about it? See, this, like would be, this would be like I planted someone in the audience, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's the intent. That's the intent. The intent is that if you know Python, you can use it as a dictionary from Python to finance. And if you know finance, you can use it as a dictionary from finance to Python. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Sorry. <laughs> uh, which one? Uh, go ahead. The data uh, which you have on the website, which on which we can do backtesting, is this the U.S. stocks data or? Yeah, we're currently U.S. markets only right now. Uh, we're working on expanding that, but you know, we're a startup, limited engineering power. We're going to have to prioritize which markets we implement. That's all. Yeah. Can you send that peer review paper they're talking about? And maybe maybe the details aren't widely known yet, but. I mean, the first thing I think about is that you've got a, a lot of people that 
question is a good example of that have never done Python or quant investing before that are writing strategies that you're using to generate your distribution. Sure. Uh, and then people that are going to come in and say, well, these are professional money managers. So uh, how do you kind of rationalize comparing the two? Sure. So a lot of what we look at in that paper, um, and I'm actually, uh, I haven't done like a full thorough read through yet. I've, I've seen some of the pictures and plots. A lot of what we do in that paper is look for various methods that um, managers claim they can use to differentiate asset performance. So the idea is not necessarily looking at the algorithms that are on the platform and just looking at that distribution blind. It's saying what methods would managers use to select algorithms that we're going to continue to do well in the future, and then monitor those and see if they continue to do well in the future. And showing that those, con those traditional selection methods, and therefore the same tools that the managers are using for their own uh, investment strategies generally tend not to work when rigorously tested out of sample. So in that case, would it be like fund of funds that are kind of looking at several hedge funds that have specific strategies, or even the strategies within the fund itself? So the thing about finance is that really, when you get down to it, everything is a fund of fund because everything is an asset, and you as an investment manager construct a portfolio of assets and then sell that to someone else and then they construct a portfolio of assets and then sell that to someone else and like magically the world works. And so in general, like the same skills are used in a lot of different ways to um, construct these portfolios. But yes, the most specific example would be fund of funds uh, or like institutional fund allocators. Uh, yeah. Um, is there any way to put free NLA data into the platform? For example, I want to create a basket of non-US equities, large US equities, and, and, and then use the, uh, and, and the right my algorithm. Would that be uh, something trivial, or is that going to be challenging to uh, You certainly can't trade uh, non-US. Uh, uh, you maybe you could go and like, you could have an algorithm in which you pulled the data in, because you can pull data into algorithms in the research environment. So you could definitely do the research if you wanted to like trade manually. Uh, and you could also pull the data into the algorithm and just have it output a trade signal, and then like manually make the trades if it were a low frequency strategy. Um, but depending on what you're doing, that might be more trouble than it's worth. Uh, I would say what, the, 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 what it can do is it can do the research component. So it, if you could just pull that data into the research platform, uh, and then like basically evaluate what you're thinking as an idea. Um, then there are other local uh, execution <coughs> services that actually do enable you to write algorithms um, around here. I don't know them specifically, but I've heard that there are. So what you could do is you could use Quantopian as just a, a research and strategy validation tool and then actually run the execution on another, another website. I, I like the way you present uh, the, uh, the strategy result against the benchmark, uh, the index mm -hmm. benchmark. But is there any way for me to present the signals as well onto the chart itself or, or, or create my own chart? Um, yep, so one of the things we've open sourced is um, the, uh, it's called Pyfolio, and it's a performance analytics library in Python. Um, so I'll show you just a quick example of what that looks like. So this is actually, uh, over the last, I would say, six to 12 months, we've been developing tools to evaluate strategies for fund selection. Um, and uh, all the code that we wrote to choose which strategies we're gonna put into the fund, um, we put into a library and open sourced as Pyfolio. So uh, what you can do is the first thing is you can um, load all the back test results into uh, the research environment. Um, and then once you have that, you can, you can pretty much do anything you want with it, right? Because at that point, you're just it's it's raw Python, and uh, you can you know you can plot plot it in any way you want. Um, and then we also give you kind of some built-in features as well. Uh, this one's known as our tear sheet, which is what like this is our first go-to just quick check um, results for for every algorithm that we're considering for fund selection. Um, and this you'll see, it can take a little bit to develop because it's, it's running a ton of computations, um, but uh, it'll give you all sorts of uh, custom analytics on algorithm performance and you know, why you may or may not want to invest in this strategy. Uh, yeah, oh sorry. Uh, how important is the speed of the algorithm for data analysis or real trading? Like, 
Could, could you repeat the question? I mean, uh, does it have to react in one second, five minutes? Yeah, totally depends on the scale of your model. So every model has a predictive time horizon, uh, and it depends on how, like, a lot, some models are predictive over the next 30 days, some models are predictive over the next 90 days, some models are predictive over the next 90 microseconds, right? Totally depends on the model. Um, in general, all it means is that you just have to uh, use models that are going to be predictive over time horizons, um, you know, kind of an order of magnitude bigger than the latency. So. Uh, if you're running a high frequency strategy in which you're running a model in which you know it's only going to have predictive power over the next second, yes, you need very, very low latency systems and probably very close proximity to the exchanges. But again, that puts you into such a high barrier to entry game that that's kind of impossible because then at that point you need to have physical space on an exchange, which is, is just so rare these days, um, so expensive. So Quantopian deals exclusively in the, the kind of medium and low frequency zone. Um, which means that uh, basically, uh, the because you have minute lead data, um, the slowdown incurred by running it on Amazon Web Services and in Python is such a minute fraction of the time horizon over which the algorithms are predictive that it doesn't matter. So it's just all about comparing your latency to your predictive time horizon. That's all. Uh, yeah. 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 How about uh, com combining your data with uh, scikit learn or TensorFlow? Uh, so I know we have scikit-learn. Uh, I'm not sure about the other one. Uh, we have a whitelist of libraries uh, rather than allowing everything. Um, for obvious security reasons, uh, you know, a lot of libraries kind of are a little sloppy and give access to some things that they shouldn't um, when you import them. And uh, as I'm sure you're aware, the goal of most hackers is to run arbitrary code on a foreign server. And we are telling people to run arbitrary code on our servers, and also our servers are connected to people's bank accounts. So it's like pretty imperative to us <laughs> that we keep it safe. Um, we have a lot of examples of uh, machine learning applications. Uh, they're all over the community. Actually, that's something I didn't. I don't think I even talked about today. Um, we have a forum. People share lots of interesting stuff. If you're interested, go on this forum. Search something you're interested in. I'm sure there'll be things that pop up. And if you see this symbol, it means someone has shared an algorithm. They're not going to share their money-making algorithms. They're going to share interesting learning examples, things they're stuck on, etc. Uh, this symbol means that someone has shared a notebook, uh, and so you can very quickly start like uh, just like looking for interesting examples of other people's work. Are there any companies that uh, build their own business on top of the platform? Yep, uh, there's a, definitely a few examples of startup hedge funds that have and like other, not necessarily even hedge funds, but like energy traders and that kind of stuff, who have taken Zipline, forked it, modified it for their own use, and used that to um, start up their company and get investments. Uh, and some people use just like Quantopian by itself. So they just use the Quantopian app as presented over the web. Um, it's definitely becoming more, more common. Uh, and one of the reasons that we want to do a certification model as well as an online course is that we're seeing, um, nobody's gonna admit this, but I've heard about it happening a lot now. Uh, a lot of companies are starting to use Quantopian as part of the hiring process. So like for instance, Goldman Sachs, if you're applying to be a quant analyst there, will say your resume looks great, but let's actually test you can code, so go on Quantopian and do this. And it's just a way of actually seeing if they can get their hands dirty before they, they get hired. Um, and in fact, there's uh, several people on Quantopian that we know of who, purely based on the stuff that they've released on the forums, have been um, hired recruited by funds uh, because again just like it's it's an easy question if, if you're trying to hire someone as a, as a fund and one of the people has a great resume and the other person actually has real examples of the work that you're asking them to do on a database basis you know it's just it's a uh, it's less risk so there's 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 um, usage in both both directions I would say yes so in, so in, in real in real trading, how, how significant is the P value? Uh, what was the question? Like how significant P values are, I guess, and in, in, in like realistically what people are okay with. Uh, and it depends on who you talk to. It depends on whether or not the people you talk to are gonna lose money next year, right? And in general, the way that good quants do it is they don't really use complicated techniques. They use very simple techniques. Uh, they're just really statistically mature about evaluating whether the technique makes any sense. And if they get dubious p-values, 
they just move on to another technique, right? This is, this is kind of the Nate Silver. If you guys are familiar with Nate Silver, this is the Nate Silver approach to statistics where it's like if you have this complicated thing and your simple model isn't working, it's actually kind of not worth your time to make the model more complicated. It's actually better just to move on to a new problem, right? Your bang for buck is better. So that's oftentimes how a, how a quant will work. Um, in practice, if you can't really get like great uh, p-values, um, it's usually an indication that you should just stop trying. But um, sometimes if you have to keep trying, like if your boss makes you, um, one way you can get around that is just by um, you know, uh, taking out lots of uh, independent bets, you know, just standard reducing variance in statistics. And um, you know, rather than just looking at one pair which is dubious, look at 100 dubious pairs. And like, if you can just get a 52% edge, you know, a 2% edge over random, you'll still have you know, more profitable trades than, than non-profitable trades, and you'll be OK. So a lot of what finance people do is admit the fact that they can't really get great accuracy in their predictive models and um, just try to make many, many uh, independent bets. Do you, do you see any trends like when the market corrects, more people are submitting uh, calls or uh, when, the market, when the market rallies, people are uh, busy making money and spending money on the platform or something like that? <laughs> I would just say. I would say the people who write algorithms are actually usually pretty concerned with market neutrality, so they tend to try to ignore what the market is doing. Um, and the, honestly, most of what we see is just driven by what news articles are writing about us. That's a, that's a, like many words of magnitude more as an effect than any of like market driven market driven effects. I'm yeah. actually very interested in how you guys because you, you provide the, pla uh, the Python platform for anyone to program and do benchmarking and, mm -hmm. and all that and. and Someone may be interested to you know, inject malicious code or find the mm -hmm. problems with the platform. Will you be able to share with us some of the problems that you have seen and, uh, and how, you, how you can avoid you know, people from? Sure, I mean, that's like a whole nother talk in and of itself. <laughs> and we have um, many engineers who could do a much better talk on that than I could. Uh, actually, that's one of the things I really like about Quantopian is that, like, all of the engineers really like what they do, and they are always like going and talking about it at various conferences and such. So um, we get like free publicity, you know. If we can do a conference talk on how to protect your data, you know, the data people like it. And, um, so in general, it's just um, being really vigilant about the potential attacks that could happen. And a lot of times, security holes arise when people get lazy about doing proper like code review and PRs and everything. And um, so one of the things we do is we're just really good about whenever a new piece of code is put up for PR, like someone will do security checks on it. We have many security checks built into our um, build testing. So whenever you submit new code, there's many security checks that will automatically run on the new branch and try to probe for, for weaknesses. Um, for instance, whenever you whitelist a new module, there's just an automatic check that's run uh, that looks for all the new things. It just compares the memory space of the new and old stuff, and it just looks for anything potentially dangerous in the, in the difference between the memory spaces. Um, and uh, then there's just, beyond that, you know, standard encrypted databases, everything's encrypted connections. You know, nothing leaves your browser window without being encrypted, and nothing leaves our servers without being encrypted. And then um, beyond, uh, beyond that, then there's also just like kind of the, the more mechanical stuff. Like um, we don't load our whole code base onto every server. We only load what's necessary so that if, a, if that server becomes compromised, we can more effectively isolate that server and make it more difficult for that compromise to break into other servers. Right? That's a classic way that can happen if one server is weak and your entire code base is on that server or that server has like more permissions than it should, then that can quickly spread. So try to make it harder to, harder to spread um, that way. And uh, just building lots of different layers of security. So making sure that each system acts independently uh, and talks to another system using like a well-defined contract API versus like kind of a more careless um, and vulnerable uh, communication profile. You know, it's just, Imagine that each each system is its own company talking to each other, and then treat like build up the security in that fashion rather than rather than um, kind of treating everything as in the same app. You know that can help. So lots of different ways, um, and uh, other engineers could do a much better job of telling you about this than I could. But that's those are kind of the general principles. 
that, that we apply, and lots of audits, lots of audits. Uh, yeah? To that point, there's actually a, if you go to the podcasts, on Apple's podcast, there's a, a Quantopian engineer that does a podcast, and he talks about that point exactly. I think what they do is they spin up a Flask server for every session, and it's, it's a really interesting talk about how they do exactly the, that layer of security. So, I had no idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'll, I'll find it, and then I'll post it on your, uh, your, your uh, videos. Yeah. Thank you. I wasn't lying about the fact that we have engineers who talk about this. So. <laughs> uh, any more questions for Delaney? Sorry, uh, yeah. I came in late, so I'm not sure if the question was asked, just in case. Uh, what is the average age that the model uh, still remains profitable uh, before it obviously posted online? Um, that distribution is so, so, so volatile. I couldn't, I couldn't even name you a centrality of that distribution. Different for every type of model. Uh, also, remember the time that it takes for you to evaluate a model can uh, can affect, like, eat into its potential profitability window. So, um, something that I was actually like one of the things I plotted in um, when I was looking at the performance evaluation and I was, when I was in the notebook is I was plotting the alpha over time, uh, and oftentimes in here uh, in this alpha plot you'll see like initial high profitability and then like it will start just slowly decaying over time. And there are famous examples of um, people, uh, yeah, like this one. You can see here, there's just like a, a constant decay as it loses profitability. Yeah. And it would lose. I mean, there's no way that it would remain constant. But uh, even if a model, say, predicts for three days or five days, it works, right? Uh, yeah. Any rough idea whether it would stay stable for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days? Mm. In general, the longer time horizon of predictability means a longer lifespan. So these like long-term value investing strategies tend to stay pro uh, profitable for, um, you know, on the order of years. Whereas, uh, and, and again, it depends on whether other people find out about them, right? Actually, one thing that you can do is if there's a few cases in which people have written books about strategies, and um, I just did this today. Someone has re-implemented a strategy from their book on the Quantopian forums. So I went and I looked at the alpha decay, and sure enough, as you might suspect, the alpha basically reached the point of complete decay right as the book was published. <laughs> so this is always how it happens. Um, in general, uh, if anybody sells you a book that's like detailing specific strategies, they are no longer valid. Books on tools, totally fine. Like, you know, it's statistics, textbooks, or anything like that. Great, um, but if someone's trying to tell you that this is exactly how you should be trading, it just means that they stopped. It stopped being profitable for them already, and that's why they're trying to make money off of the book. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's a couple of examples like the, the book published by uh, Melvin Faber. So he did, uh, he did publish a few. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. He implemented it, but you know, it doesn't really affect it anymore. Right. Um, there was an author for Straits Times, and she shared a lot of different strategies, but the moment of course you share these strategies, it doesn't work. Yep. <laughs> no very anymore. Yep, no. exactly. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's harder to make money off of book sales than it is off of running a strategy, so why would you do that, basically? Unless, uh, I've seen a few cases where if it's high frequency, then it still works because there's a sufficient barrier to entry. Yeah, that's true. So it depends on how many people can implement it, for sure. Uh, but on the other hand, high frequency strategies have lifespans of like two months, often, depending on the strategy uh, and who's running it. Oftentimes, these are models that will like start be predictive and then just decay over six weeks. At least that's what I've heard from people working in the industry. Mm -hmm. But would that uh, make people not want to share their strategies on the platform because of this? I mean, people are not going to publicly share their you know cash cows. But they share all sorts of research reproductions and, and learning examples and, and like tools and tricks. And um, the reason for that is, you know, they realize that if everybody shares a bit, then everybody has a much easier time when they want to build their own. Uh, so we encourage it as much as possible. But at the same time, yeah, you're not going to get something that you will deploy right now and will start printing money. You'll get something that maybe worked two years ago, and then you have to figure out, okay, how do I modify it to work again? You have to take that step in the arms race, basically. Yeah. I have a question regarding the strategy itself. How do you incorporate a cost exposure into the strategy itself? So there are existing strategies on the 
uh, community that talk about exactly how to incorporate Hearst exponents into strategies, and there's code to do that. Uh, so I just recommend looking up uh, Hearst exponent in the community, and you'll get examples of people who have done that already. So. The last two questions. Yeah. So uh, you're running backpatch, right? How many API calls do you allow to your backend server? Uh, so I think we limit it by IP to it's it's a pretty large amount. Like if you're if you're if you are, um, we don't allow, we don't offer like a, a programmatic API, so you'd have to like open tabs. Like, so if you like wrote a Selenium plugin to your browser and then like opened 300 tabs and started back testing all of them, you'd probably hit the limit then, but I don't think you could like physically move your mouse fast enough to hit the limit unless you're like a professional e-gamer. So, <laughs> um, which gave me an idea for a marketing event we could do. Um, but, <laughs> Uh, the short answer is we actually put very few limits on resources that users can use. And in general, um, the uh, distribution of uh, resource demand is exponential enough that we can um, deal in individually with the people who demand more resources uh, and just like work with them maybe to like have their functions run better or, or what times of the night they can do it or like let's spread it out over this time period. Um, we don't put strict reinforcements. It's more like if you run into the problems, like let us know and we'll try to work with you so that you can get what you need to get done done. Great, another uh, question? So do you also provide real-time data on your platform? Yep, so everything on the platform can be live traded with, with real money. Uh, or fake money, depending on how you want to trade it. I recommend fake money first. And, uh, <laughs> and the way you do that is uh, if you go to um, algorithms, uh, anything that has a backtest successfully run, if you go to that backtest right here, um, as soon as this loads, All right. I always like how it looks like it's running, but it's actually just that it's fetching the results from the database, and that your browser is fragile enough that it can't just like dump them in all at once. So it has to, to load them in gradually. So if you just hit this button, live trade, um, if I had a brokerage account that I wanted to link, I would just hit here, and that would have you added real money. I'll do fake money. Um, and I'll just start it with like $100,000 capital. <laughs> fake money. And uh, yeah, market's closed in the US right now. But uh, the next time the market opens up, this little guy will start trading, and uh, you can check in and, and see how it, well, you can't, but I could check in and see how it's doing because it's private. So, okay, so uh, let's give uh, the Tonight's session, I would like to thank uh, Skyscanner for hosting uh, us, uh, hosting our meetup. I would like to thank Michael for coming here to record uh, our session, and finally thank Watopian um, for sponsoring the food. So, um, we paid for the food? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we did. I did. Yeah, yeah, you guys did. And so, uh, again, You're welcome. <laughs> uh, and again, uh, whoever is interested in the uh, Open Data Science uh, Initiative, please. You know, check out our Facebook website, and if you don't have an account, please register for one. For the purpose, okay? And uh, that's all. Good night, and have a, you know, the night is young. I don't know, party, whatever. Thank you. I'm a, 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 I'm a,